Here amid the beauty of the Anasazi ruins of Kawawa, it is hard to imagine that as humankind enters the last decade of the 20th century, its relationship with the natural world is in traumatic jeopardy. The greenhouse effect, ozone depletion, overpopulation have transformed the natural world from God's domain into a wretched human problem that must be solved. We are, as one writer put it, witnessing the end of nature as we know it. What are we to do? Where are we to look for help? One obvious answer involves learning from cultures that have flourished and survived by maintaining a harmonious balance between the human and the natural worlds. In New Mexico, modern society has one profound example of such wholeness with which to be inspired, the enduring perspective of Pueblo Indian worldviews. In her writings and work, architect Rena Swensel from Santa Clara Pueblo shares with us the Pueblo worldview. Quote, at the center of the Pueblo belief system, she says, is the conviction that people are not separate from nature and natural forces. The goal of human existence, she says, is to maintain wholeness or oneness with the natural universe. Pueblo and Anasazi cultures have survived for a thousand years or more on the strength of that conviction. They have constructed their towns and cities around the idea that the buildings humans make are just as much a part of nature as mountains and other landforms are. In other words, the earth is not an exploitable commodity for Pueblo peoples. It is a sacred space, a concept which the modern world desperately needs to understand. But Pueblo peoples don't do any preaching about sacredness. They live it. Soft-spoken and understated, Rena Swensel of Santa Clara Pueblo shares a cultural perspective with us of inestimable value to modern society as it struggles to survive its own abuse of the planet on which it lives and ultimately depends. Last summer, as I stood on top of one of Santa Clara Pueblo's sacred mountains, I was most impressed by the wind, the beauty of the clouds, and the flow of the hills down below. There is a shrine on top of that mountain with a few well-placed stones which define a small area scattered with cornmeal and a deeply worn path in the bedrock. No special structure celebrates the sacredness of that place. Architecturally, it is understated, almost inconspicuous. That particular shrine is typical of Pueblo shrines in that it is visually disappointing. It is nevertheless a very special place because it is a place of access to the underworld from which Pueblo people emerged. It is a doorway of communication between the many simultaneous levels of Pueblo existence. Understanding the visual understatement of that shrine is important to understanding Pueblo sacred space. Visually and physically understating shrines, or for that matter, Pueblo community and house forms stems from the very nature of Pueblo cosmology. At the center of the Pueblo belief system is the conviction that people are not separate from nature and natural forces. This insoluble connection with nature has existed from the beginning of time. The goal of human existence is to maintain wholeness or oneness with the natural universe. Santa Clara Pueblo was a wonderful place for a child to grow up. 
I was a child there in the 1940s and remember the incredible sense of well-being and containment, both socially and physically, from the plaza or the bupingi, which is literally the middle heart place of the Pueblo, we could see the far mountains encircle our lives in place. The Bupingu, or heart of the earth, for the Tewa people is the open community space where the ritual dances and other community activities happen. The Bupingu contains the literal center of the earth, or the Nansipu, which translates as the belly root of the earth. Each Pueblo's cosmos encircles the Nansipu, and the surrounding mountains where the earth and sky touch are the boundaries of the well-organized spaces for people, animals, and spirits to live. The house in Kiva also emulated the low hills and mountains in their interconnectedness to the earth. The adobe structures flowed out of the earth, and it was often difficult to see where the ground stopped and where the structures began. The house structures were, moreover, connected to each other, enclosing an outdoor space from which we could directly connect with the sky and focus on the moving clouds. There was one day when I was walking from the Pueblo to the day school and walking through the fields and along the, uh, the stream by, through sagebrush uh, bushes sort of looking around, taking everything in. And as I looked up, there was this incredible cloud in the sky. And it kept moving, it kept changing. And I was maybe seven or eight years old, watching this wonderful cloud billow and grow and, and change its form in front of me. But it was so exciting. It, it felt so close. And yet it was so it was so full of it was so full of energy and it was so full of life. It moved and it changed and I could see its form uh, getting bigger and and uh, the the blue and back of it was so was was just unbelievable and this enormous white billowing that that was just moving within itself. It was it was uh, transforming in front of me. I stood there and I must have watched that cloud for about half an hour before I went on my way to school. But it was one of those moments in my life when I began to realize what it meant when the people talked about what happened to us when we die. When we die, we go, our energies go into becoming clouds. We become the clouds, and we move through the sky as that cloud was doing. And then we uh, uh, drop water on the earth. And that whole cycle of moving between the earth and the sky became very clear to me. The Kiva structure was totally symbolic. Its rooftop was like the Pueblo Plaza space from where we could connect with the sky, while the rooftop opening took us into the Kiva structure, which was like going back into the earth via the Nansipu in the plaza space. The connecting ladder of tall spruce stood in the middle near the Nansipu, a simple stone. The single simple stone in the middle of uh, Tewa Pueblo, uh, extremely significant because it is the place that reminds us of where we came from. It is a place that we flow, where we flow back into the underworld, and it is that place out of which the out of which the breath flows. It is the place that we that we flow in and out of to connect with with the other levels of existence that are there simultaneous to this one. But usually but usually all that marks that very incredible place in the earth is a gray stone that is not even special looking 
It's, usually, it's just a stone that would be picked up in the fields, in the arroyo, or out by the river, where, wherever, and it, and it gets brought and placed there. And it is, it is the, it's just the center of the world. Everything is organized to constantly remind us of the primary connections with the earth, sky, and other life forms. These primary connections are constantly reiterated. As at that shrine that I mentioned earlier, the Nansipu and other points of this well-organized cosmos are marked by a very inconspicuous stone or grouping of stones. This physical understating of sacred places is typical of Pueblo thinking because it, it is believed that it is better to understate than overstate, to be one with everything rather than be separate or conspicuous. There is then little need to create or cause distinctions among people or objects or even places. Since everything, every body, and every place is sacred and has essential worth, there is no need to individuate. The people and their world are sacred and indivisible. The shrines, boundary markers, and centers then serve as constant reminders of the religious symbolic nature of life. Pueblo people do live at the center of the universe. Their world is sacramental. It is a world thoroughly impregnated with the energy, purpose, and sense of the creative natural forces. It is all one. Sacredness, then, is recognizable in everyday life. The purpose of life for the Pueblo people is to be intimately connected with everything in the natural world. Directional forces of the world, of the world are cyclical and move in and out of the earth rather than upwards towards the heavens. Clay is talked to because it is the earth and shares in the flow of life. That flow described as Owaha, water, wind, breath, is the essence of life. Existence is not determined by a physical body or other physical manifestation, but by the breath which is symbolized by the movement of water and the wind. It is the breath which flows without distinction through the entirety of animate and inanimate existences. It is movement, it is transformation, it is literally the breath. Every time we take a breath, we become the universe, we become the Oaha. Because it is the Oaha that gives expression to the universe. That's why we can talk about the world being non discriminatory, because we are all expressions of that breath. And uh, the cosmos itself being an expression of the of the energy that flows through it. It is the it is life itself. Uh, it is that which makes the water water flow and the wind blow. It is a movement in the, in the world. The Pohaha, then, is the creative force causing life, much as Christian God is the originator and creator of Christian existence. Further, the belief that the Pohaha flows through inanimate as well as animate beings allows buildings, ruins, places, to have lifespans and to come and go as do other forms of life. Buildings and defined spaces are allowed to have life and death. One day as I was 
I was about tasting houses on my way to school, I noticed that there was a crack forming in the wall of one of the better tasting houses. And uh, watched that, that crack uh, for a couple of days and saw that it kept getting bigger. I went home and asked my grandmother why those people weren't doing anything about that crack that was forming in the wall. She shook her finger at me and says, it's none of your concern. That's been a good house. It's been fed. It's been blessed. It's been healed. It's been taken care of. It's served the people well, and it's now time for it to go back into the earth again. I stood there for a moment and, and says, do you mean the house is going to die? And she says, yes, and it's good, the house. Now it's time for the house to go back into the earth again. And that again, back to that notion of cycles again, that the greatest respect that you can pay any gift to anybody, whether it's a tree, a plant, an animal, house is that you allow them that cycle of life and death, the coming and going out of the earth. And sure enough, the house fell down. <laughs> There is general acceptance that houses, human bodies, plant forms are temporary abodes through which the Pohaha flows. They share in the essence of life which gives them cycles of life, birth and death. Traditional Santa Clara Pueblo with its soluble mud structures is an organic unit expanding, contracting and changing with other life forms and forces. The older I get, and as I watch how the world is changing, the more I understand the value of our old lifestyles, beliefs, and architecture for ourselves, as well as for other people who have moved away from an intimate relationship with the land, clouds, and other life forms. I see that the respect for the natural environment that was inherent in the style and the process of building was so special and crucial for the survival of the world. I value tremendously the unselfconsciousness or lack of aesthetic pretensions which led to doing everything straightforwardly, yet which still considered the context and connections so that the practical and symbolic function were never lost. Most importantly, I treasure the sense of sacredness which pervaded that old Pueblo world. All of life, including walls, rocks, people, were part of an exquisite flowing unity.